The National Broadcasting Company invites you to a visit with Carl Sandburg. In his 76th year, Carl Sandburg, the American poet and biographer of Lincoln, who has twice won the Pulitzer Prize, made this film especially for NBC television. His guest is Edward Stanley, manager of NBC Public Service Programs. Here the Queen of Sheba came with Solomon of old, with an ass load of spices, pomegranates, and a fine gold. And when she saw this lovely land, her heart was filled with joy straightway. She said, I'd like to be a queen in uh, Illinois. She's bounded by the Wabash, the Ohio, and uh, the lakes. She's crawfish in the swampy lands, the milk sick and uh, the shakes. But these are slight diversions and take not from the joy of living in this garden land, the state of uh, Illinois. Then move your family westward, bring all your girls and boys, and cross that Shawnee Ferry to the state of uh, Illinois. The song places you in time and geography, all right, Carl. Oh, you out of Nebraska, one of the corn huskers, west of Omaha. I've been in Omaha. <laughs> That's well, Midwest, all right. That's Midwest. It's at the edge of it. What was it like growing up in central Illinois before there were any automobiles? Well, one thing a man thinks of, first of all, is horses, horses, everywhere horses. And a man can think of how uh, politics then was about the same as now. Just as much shenanigans as ever. Mm -hmm. In, uh, I was six years old in October of 1884 when my father took me downtown to see a Republican torchlight procession. This is in Galesburg. Yes. Hundreds of Republicans, each one with a lighted torch on his shoulder. And a flambeau core. Pipes, long pipes that blow, and there would be three, four feet of fire up there, a kind of a big fire flower. All at once, 16 of them shooting up in the air. It was a wonder to my boy eyes. And uh, they would march sometimes, Blaine, Blaine, James G. Blaine. My father had told me that was the candidate of the Republican Party. But uh, while they were marching, every once in a while there would come from a sidewalk a hurrah for Cleveland. And then from the procession there would come and a rope to hang them. And you know, uh, I was a nice little six-year-old Republican. I had never seen a hanging. I didn't know what hanging was like. But uh, if the Republicans were for it, I was like my father. I was a Republican, and I was for the hanging of Grover Cleveland. But a few weeks pass, and uh, the country elected Grover Cleveland instead of hanging him. They elected him president of the United States. And he appoints for postmaster in Galesburg, a neighbor of ours, only two weeks, only two blocks away, a, a, an Irishman named Billy Tuick. Politics was as full of changes and surprises then as it is now. <laughs> Carl, I've been reading your book, Always the Young Stranger, and it seems to me that your father was a very strong force in your life. Well, I wouldn't hesitate about saying that he was a more honest man than I have been in all of my days. He was a very scrupulous man. He didn't know how to write his name. He knew how to read. He say he was an illiterate, but uh, he could, uh, in the various houses that he bought and uh, paid for, he could do a job of plastering or wallpapering. He could uh, 
take bricks out from a moldering foundation and do a job of bricklaying. He uh, uh, was a man uh, of many trades. When he quit his job at the blacksmith's shop with the Q Railroad, he made a good living as a handyman, doing odd jobs of all sorts for all sorts of people. He, he was kind of sort of superior to books. He would pass me by when I had my head in a book on some cold winter night and say, uh, Charlie, what good is it to read that book? Carl, is there something in the soil in Illinois that yeasts up so many poets and statesmen? Well, it goes in periods. It was a quite a time between Lincoln and Grant and their great performances. Before there came a string of them, John P. Altgeld, Frank O'Loudon was a great governor, had a genius of a certain sort. Rachel Lindsay, Edgar Lee Masters. You could name Adley Stevenson. Uh, just why they yeast up, there's no telling. Some areas of America, they lie fallow, and then they suddenly blossom with human performance. Were you writing poetry as a boy? What uh, got you started? What forces in that uh, railroad town or in college uh, shaped you? Oh, I read things as a boy that had mystery of sound and rhythm. Charles Dickens, uh, A Child's Dream of a Star, and uh, Elegy in a Country Churchyard. But I didn't write any as a boy. It's hard to say how I moved into uh, what I wrote that I termed poetry, but there's still argument about whether it is poetry or not. Uh, any of your college professors, you went to Lombard. Yes, there was one professor there, Philip Greenwright. The man was a mathematician, an astronomer, a historian, a printer and a bookbinder, and he was a poet, and he lit me up. Uh, when I think of the word teacher in its highest values, I think back to my old friend Philip Greenwright, a professor. When people use that word in any ridiculous tone of voice, uh, I have only scorn for them. What did you do when you got out of college? I wandered and I groped. It's a long story. Uh, I headed back uh, after two or three years of wandering, groping. I headed back from a town in New Jersey to Fort Illinois, but I got stopped in Allegheny. I was arrested at McKee's Rocks. Uh, charged with riding on a railroad train without a ticket. It was a coal gondola. And uh, I got 10 days in the Allegheny County Jail, but that's a long, short story. Four years of college, 10 days in the Allegheny County Jail. I'd say you had the high and the low of education. The high and the low of education. That's, that's a correct term for that. <laughs> Was there any American poet or writer who influenced you? Oh, Walt Whitman, Edward Arlington Robinson, and uh, a group there, Robert Frost, Vachel Lindsay, Edgar Lee Masters, Thomas Hornsby Farrell out in Denver, uh, one of our great American poets who is uh, uh, somewhat neglected. The same goes for Edwin Ford Piper in Iowa. The interactions between these modern poets, uh, no man can, uh, no man can measure, uh, no man can uh, say rightly and accurately with strictness what has influenced him. Could you say briefly, Carl, what you've been saying in your poetry, what you've been getting at? Well, that runs into a definition of poetry. One time writing a. Uh, Rock Island train from El Paso to Chicago. I wrote 300 definitions of poetry. And on a trip from Chicago to Boston that same month, I wrote 100 more. Then I trimmed those 400 definitions of poetry down to 38, which I printed up front in uh, a book titled Good Morning America. I'd like to hear you read some poetry, Carl. You must have uh, not the favorite poem, but you must have some favorite poems. Did you read one? The sketch here titled Fazag. Oh, yes. 
It ain't no lyric at all, except in the comic sense, perhaps. This face you got, this here fazag you carry around, you never picked it out for yourself at all at all, did you? This here fazag, somebody handed it to you, am I right? Somebody said, here's yours, now go see what you can do with it. Somebody slipped it to you and it was like a package marked, no goods exchanged after being taken away. This face you got. Snatch of slip horn jazz, that's another one. I think we have that here. Snatch of slip horn jazz. Are you happy? It's the only way to be, kid. Yes, be happy. It's a good, nice way to be. But not happy, happy, kid. Don't be too doubled up, doggone happy. It's the doubled up, doggone happy people. Bust hard, they do bust hard when they bust. Be happy, kid. Go to it. But not too doggone happy. You have longer sterner poems of people, yes. There was one you told me about that you rather liked called A Couple. Oh, yes. A Couple. He was in Cincinnati, she in Burlington. He was in a gang of postal telegraph linemen. She was a pot wrestler in a boarding house. The crying is lonely, she wrote him. The same here, he answered. The winter went by and he came back and they married. And he went away again where rainstorms knocked down telegraph poles and wires dropped with frozen sleet. And again she wrote him, the crying is lonely. And again he answered, the same here. Their five children are in the public schools. He votes the Republican ticket and is a taxpayer. They are known among those who know them as honest American citizens living honest lives. Many things that bother other people never bother them. They have their five children, and uh, they are a couple. They are a couple. A pair of birds that call to each other and satisfy. As sure as he goes away, she writes him, oh, the crying is lonely. And he flashes back the old answer, the same here. A long time since he was a gang lineman at Cincinnati and she was a pot wrestler in a Burlington boarding house. Yet, they never got tired of each other. They are a couple. They are a couple. Carl, I started to say up a little bit ago, you have other kinds of poetry like uh, the people, yes, but how do you write? Uh, do you have an idea and it sets itself down? You incubate them? And sometimes you have a hot first draft and you write it off and you never change a word. You never change a comma even. And then there are others that you wrestle along with for years and years. You lay them by and make little changes in them. Sometimes you decide you never will print it, that it isn't going to come through. And then again, after your work on it, it does come through. I'd say there are two wide categories. I started writing a book that was to be titled. I told my good friend Alfred Harcourt, the publisher, I told him that the title was to be that old-fashioned title, The Life of Abraham Lincoln for young people. I told him it might run five or six hundred pages. But as I got into it, there was so much more source material than had ever been used before, things that interested me. I followed the same rule with that book that I have, with every book that I have written. I wanted to write a book that I was sure would have interested me, that I would have wanted very much 20 or 30 years earlier in my life. And, uh, this grew into, finally, a two-volume book that uh, ran some 350,000 words. Abraham Lincoln, The Prairie Years. Then later I carried it on. I wasn't sure that I would undertake it. I, I uh, started writing Abraham Lincoln, The War Years. I thought it would 
run about two volumes, be about the length of the prairie years. But it ran into something like a one and one quarter million words. The six volumes make the longest biography ever written in the uh, Western Hemisphere. There may have been longer ones written in Europe, Asia, or Africa, or some one of the archipelagos of the seas, but I don't know. How do you account for the way uh, in which Americans seem just to soak up information and, and uh, uh, knowledge of Lincoln? Oh, because he's a titanic character with mystery attaching to him, all the mystery that attaches to the word democracy. And uh, that other phrase, the American dream, it's there in him more than in any other one man. Jefferson had it greatly, Washington too, but uh, somehow or other Lincoln is closer to the people and he's closer to, uh, oh, storm, kind of storm that we're going through now. In a certain sense, there's a global civil war going on now. And uh, he was the mastermind of an awful, Civil War, a war of brothers. David Lord George came over here after his experience as prime minister during World War I. He stopped in Springfield and he made the remark there that a civil war is much more difficult for a prime minister to handle than a war with a foreign power. And I think he's valued on account of more than a million words that he wrote and spoke in that utterance record of his, more than a million words, and nearly all of it holds good for this present hour. So much of it holds good for this present hour. So seldom, as you feel with so many other men in that time, so seldom do you feel sorry for him for what he wrote then. Most of them, I read hundreds of speeches made on the floor of the House and the Senate. It got with me where I was sorry for them for how little they understood the history that was in the making before their own eyes. And I think Lincoln understood the balance, the balances required in a democracy between freedom and that other word, responsibility. He wrote and spoke that word responsibility nearly as often as he did the word freedom. You can't have one and not the other. Too many forget that. He had such a responsibility about what he said and wrote. He didn't want to mislead anybody. I think one of his sentences in a message to Congress in 1862, in times like the present, men should utter nothing for which they would not willingly be responsible through time and eternity. How many of them shoot off their mouths at the first impulse and enjoy it, indulge themselves in passionate utterance. There's too much of it in the American political scene. Why do you suppose it is that nearly a century after his death, we still have implicit confidence that he understands us? Oh, he was so wide-ranging a human personality. He had a range from the darkest of grief, looking at the human tragedy. And then he had a sense of comedy, a sense of the comic that ran from rough barnyard humor on to very delicate ironics that you have to read twice to really get them. He understood nearly everything in the human pageant. Lawyers who tried cases with him, there was more than one case, uh, more than one instance of a lawyer saying he made a better statement of my case than I did. A uh, Chicago editor, John Locke Scripps, who wrote as to Lincoln in the first campaign biography of him, 1860, he wrote, he has an exquisite sense of justice.
He has an exquisite sense of justice. Not often. That is said of any man. Practical. He was practical and yet he was a dreamer. Both. There were those who referred to him as a boor. One of the most common designations of him by his enemies was baboon and the Illinois ape. One time a woman came to him in the White House with a request. He seated himself at his desk and wrote on a card and stood up and handed the card to her. And she read it and then said, she knew she had only to take it to the War Department and her request was granted. She'd had three sons. All three had gone into the army. Two of them were gone for all time. The third one was under 18, illegally enlisted. She wanted him to come home and be a support to her. And Lincoln had given her that. She read the card and she said to him, of course, I must be going. I must not be taking your time. I suppose we'll never meet again unless in heaven. And Linga took her arm and walked with her to the door of the room as he said to her, Well, with all of my troubles, I will probably not get to this resting place that you refer to. But if I do, I'm sure I'll find you there. Is that manners? What out of the mystery and the greatness of Lincoln, what attributes should mean the most to us now in these terrible times? Well, he'd use the word, that adjective sober, the noun sobriety. He, did a, he wrote a message to Congress in 1862 in December. He was proposing that Congress should enact a measure by which the slaves could be bought in the border slave states that had not seceded from the Union. They should not, the federal government should not seize that property. And... Uh, it would make for goodwill. It would shorten the time of the war, he felt. And he wrote, fellow citizens, we cannot escape history. The fiery trial through which we pass will let us down in honor or dishonor to the latest generation. The dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate for the stormy present. Will that sentence go for today? The dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate for the stormy present. And he added, we must think anew, we must act anew. We must disenthrall ourselves. I think that's the only time, the only time in the million words that Lincoln wrote or spoke that he used that verb disenthrall. In the old Anglo-Saxon days, a thrall was a bondsman tied to the land, a serf bought and sold with the land. Anytime he should break his bonds, he was a free man. And, he, and Lincoln meant they should break from traditions. They would have to find new channels of thought in order to get out of their present predicaments. And then the matter of malice. He could have scorn and wrath for certain abstractions, but not for individuals. He wrote a letter to a military governor of Louisiana with regard to a current problem, ending it. I shall do nothing in malice or what I deal with is too fast for malicious dealing. And all the things that he said during those four years as chief magistrate, 
Not once did he say anything that the South could conveniently use for propaganda against him. Other things said and done in the North they could use for propaganda, but nothing that Lincoln said. In the Gettysburg speech, it's very significant that he refers to the brave men who died here have consecrated this ground far beyond our poor, I forget what is the word there. He did not say the brave union men who died here. On the score of bravery, it was about even. And uh, we could do with a little less hate in the American political scene now. We could do with a little less of malice and malicious utterance. And in the world? And in the world. <laughs> what comes out from in the Soviet loudspeakers now. There is pathos about it and there's tragedy about it and at times it's comedy. They've invented everything, I guess, but baseball. That belongs to good old Abner Doubleday. <laughs> I'd like to hear the guitar, Carl. I think I'd like to hear some music growing out of the Lincoln period. You think Nebraska yields to Illinois? <laughs> These are away back. 80, 90, 100 years. No more moon, no more moon, no more moon, the Lord for me. And before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. No more crying, no more crying, no more crying the Lord for me. And before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom, Lord, for me. And before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my love and be free. I'm most grateful to you, Carl, for this visit this afternoon. Maybe we can do it again one day. Well, maybe it's, maybe I could say to you what they said in the old days on the Nebraska prairies when they fenced in with their barbed wire, the old-time open range. It's been good to know you, been good to know you.